Hello and welcome to Clamp, the weekly podcast where we discuss all things related to creating, living, and making projects. I am Morley Kurt. Joining me as always is Adam Mackey. Unfortunately, Grant could not join us this week because he is in New Brunswick, but we have a fantastic guest host here, which I will introduce very shortly. But before we do that, we wanted to talk about the Clamp Challenge, which is entering its final month. Um, So make sure you're working on your projects if you do want to enter because that time will run out very quickly. Um, But we did have some posts of people who are working on stuff. Um, Adam, you said something about DW wood builds. I know they they were using a clamp as a hanger, but you heard that they're doing another entry as well. Yeah, they, um, let me bring it up real quick. So Grant commented on their post saying, this is the lowest effort clamp entry, <laughs> clamp challenge entry, shall we see? And then they said, uh, don't judge me. I'm working on another clamp challenge entry. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, love to see the nifty clamp so uses. Um, I will say that using a clamp yeah. to hang something from, I don't think is quite the <laughs> the projects we had in mind when we came up with this challenge. But, you know, hey, use the hashtag. Uh, show us the fun ways yeah. that you use clamps. And who knows, if it's like an amazing use, if it's so over the top, just blows everything out of the water. Um, I don't know. I feel like it's got to be a project, though. You can't just You can't just use a clamp. Yeah. In a in a nifty way. Uh, we also yeah. got um, a weird guy has started his build. He got a bunch of red clamps, and I heard that he was trying to figure out a way to strip all the paint off of them. So knowing Jeff's creativity and the like hustle that he'll have in a project, and just like going all out, I'm pretty excited to see what he will do. He does not tend to disappoint Same. when it comes to level of effort. Yeah, and there's a lot of clamps. Yeah. Yeah. And another um, little clamp hack we got was from Hatch Made It, um, upgrading some slippery clamps with hockey tape. Um, Again, very cool clamp use, um, but I don't know, Hatch Made It, if you're listening, I would love to see a a full-on project build challenge entry uh, because I think that's what we're really looking for when it comes to this challenge. So without further ado, I already teased it, but um, we have a guest host this week. It's the one and only Zito Zito for his second appearance, Andrew Zito. What's going on, Andrew? How's it going? Hey, uh, it's going good. Thank you. Um, Yeah, just kind of happy to be on. Happy to join y'all. Awesome. Love this podcast. (laughs) It's so great. I'm so happy that we have you back again. And... We had a topic for this week, and I thought a good way to segue into that topic would be to hear a little bit about your kind of making origin story, because we have had you on before, but I feel like we didn't really touch on that much, and hearing a bit about that might provide some good uh, nuggets to for our topic today. So yeah, as, however you want to do it, how did you get into making, and how did your story kind of evolve? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I've kind of always done the skateboarding thing, um, kind of, you know, had a couple sponsors and was skateboarding with a bunch of teams throughout, you know, um, almost in North America, traveled out to Asia, a whole bunch of skateboard and stuff. And then, uh, you know, kind of did the whole university thing, uh, graduate engineering, going into engineering and mostly on a computer and stuff. And just kind of really felt like there was a lack of ability to really um, use my hands and stuff. So, um, that really just pushed me into woodworking. Uh, there's a shop in Ottawa called the Ottawa city wood shop and joined over there, uh, knowing that I wanted to make things ultimately with the medium that I've, uh, you know, kind of grew up with, which is skateboards and stuff. So yeah, kind of popped in there, started, took took some other classes. Matt Wallace, one of the owners took me under his wing and we made like a walnut bench with skateboard butterflies together. And then really this, uh, this homie, uh, Richard, uh, Richard Scott, um, who actually recently just passed, unfortunately, uh, he was my mentor and yeah, he really, uh, took me under his wing. And basically if I had an idea, he would know how to build it and he would help me sort of really quarterback a lot of my 
builds and stuff. And uh, yeah, the power of a mentor there, but also the willingness to kind of just hack away and try things all the time, which I think leads into said topic. Yeah. Yeah. What we wanted to talk about was like that amazing, like confidence and trickle down effects that come from learning new skills. And it, it's something I've been feeling a lot this past couple of weeks, because as I mentioned last episode, like I've been learning about canoe building, which I haven't really done yet, but in working on this tour lectern, it's given me a lot of an, it's given me like a strong outlet to practice some of these woodworking, these more like hardcore woodworking skills that I'm learning about and hope to one day make happen on a canoe build. I'm learning like all the stuff about cam with using the CNC and like actually doing that infusion. Um, and it's a lot of things which are like intimidating from the outside. So I don't know, maybe that's why it feels like it builds so much confidence because you have this thing, which is like, I, I don't know about that. I'm a little trepidatious, but then once you start and you really demystify it, it's like, I don't know. I had this moment where I was driving to go work on the lectern and I just, I felt like such like a boss. I was like, I can do anything. Like, I'm just like doing all these things that I was like at one point scared of doing. And I, I just had this like very great confident feeling of like, yes, in control, making stuff happen, not being reactive. Um, and maybe that's why, maybe that's one of the reasons people like get into making. Did you feel like that sort of addictive feeling when you started making stuff out of skateboards and woodworking? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's like the number one thing. And then I think it's just like, you know, I want to be like a helpful person uh, just in everyday life where possible. And, you know, the ability to kind of advise folks, help folks with certain builds and stuff. It's just like, it just goes so far uh, and just goes a long way, a long ways with, you know, your friends and everything like that. So yeah, really, really Genesis for, for pushing me into that for sure. And there's like a lot of people, especially like nowadays who have like little to no skills or experience, like in woodworking and making in general. So I feel like when you meet someone who like needs help or something and you can help them for you or for you or for me, like, I feel like a lot of times it feels like very minor, especially because people tend to ask for help on things that isn't like fine woodworking. It might be more like carpentry or like handyman work, but if you can actually help them with it, um, yeah, it's, it's a great feeling. People are so appreciative. Well, and it's really exciting seeing like what you're getting into now with like the 3D printing and everything along those lines. You know, you're really, I think you're, you know, especially with the, the way your channel's going, you're really teaching a ton of folks now with that newfound confidence, which is, you know, pretty amazing to see. Yeah, it's, that is nice. Um, I had someone, like one of my videos, which I think feel like has the longest tail is making 3D printed plant pots, which I don't think I realized at the time is like, a very popular use for 3D printing. I, I knew it was pretty popular, but especially like the spiral vase design, like people really want to make those. And one the, one of the reasons I made that video was I wasn't seeing much like instructional content around fusion about how to actually make those complex twisted shapes. Um, like I, I didn't just see many people were showing how to do it. And so I've had a lot of people like ask questions on that video. And just today I had someone like, you know, like, oh, you know, like, thank you so much for making this, but I keep getting this problem where like I put it into my slicer and all the, there's these holes all around my pot. And so we ended up emailing back and forth. Um, actually, I'm, I'm really, <laughs> I'm really awaiting their response because I feel like I gave them the right answer, but I want to like confirm it was right. And then because the people who are reading the comments, <laughs> right, they only see like, yeah, send me an email and I'll help you out. But I want to like close the loop. So like if anyone else has this problem, hopefully um, I can help them as well. Um, but yeah, it's really cool to be able to, to help people with stuff like that. Even though sometimes I feel like I want to be doing more like fun or like story-based videos, the more like tutorial style stuff, like people, I, I mean, I see it in the comments all the time. People are like, thank you so much for making this. I'm learning so much, or just like getting the inspiration to dive into fusion and start designing solutions to everyday problems. Adam, are you going to start diving into fusion and solving everyday problems with the 3D printer that you're definitely going to buy soon? I hope so. I have so many plans that I want, want to do with my 3D printer. I mean, as I said in the pre-show, my range is hopefully going to be back on the road next week. And there's so many things that I want to make for it. Um, like just things that I planned on doing different ways before, but now the thoughts of getting a 3D printer 
has just opened my world to the amount of things I can make. And at first I thought I was limited, like very limited to the size of the bed. And then I realized that plastic can be glued together. Yeah. And things can be printed in sections and glued together. And then pretty much everything that I print is going to get coated with Plasti Dip. I don't know if you guys know what that is. Do you get that yeah. over there? Yeah. So everything will be coated in Plasti Dip, which is going to hide the seams between all the pieces. Well, I'll hide the seams and then coat it. And yeah, so every day I'm thinking of new things I want to print for the truck and and other things like that. I mean, I know that once my wife does learns that I can do planter pots, I'm pretty sure I'll be printing a thousand of those a day. <laughs> yeah, people do a lot of like huge 3D printed assemblies. I mean, I know like people do like R2D2s that are mostly 3D printed pieces. Uh, one wow. thought that I keep having, which I don't really know if I want to do or not, is like a 3D printed skateboard. And I know like, I feel like it was a hot topic for a little while. People were doing all these like, these cool looking open open webbing kind of like designs. And my thing with 3D printing yeah. is like, or really any making in general, it's, is if I can easily buy something that achieves, it, that does its purpose well, then like, what is the point of 3D printing it or making it? Like it has to have a point, like it's either more beautiful or it's the enjoyment in making it. But with something that has like a lot of work and time input, it's like, I, I, I really have a hard time believing that a 3D printed skateboard is going to be anywhere close to the performance of a wooded skateboard. But one thought that I did have was if I, if I was to do it, I was thinking about printing out thin sheets in the same way that a skateboard is made of veneers and then epoxying those together. Um, and, it, and at that point, it's kind of like a stack of fiberglass, except instead of glass, you're using plastic, but I don't know. I, or I just feel like, ABS sheets. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, why even 3D print at that point? Just use sheets of plastic. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's kind of neat um, because it's just like, it brings something new to the table. I don't know if you see, if you ever follow Braille skateboarding. It sounds really oh, yeah. familiar. I'm gonna look did, that. They're pretty big did, on Back YouTube. in the day, I don't know Do they like, do they yeah. do, can we skate it? Yeah, yeah, so they try to make the iPad. All, yeah, well, they I think they do some stuff like that, but they've also done some like glass skateboards. And so it's like, you know, yeah. for the sake of like they just have various things, right? And so they had a glass skateboard uh and this kid Jason Park, he's awesome. He did like an impossible where it just shattered on under his feet. And then, yeah, so they, you know, for if if not for anything else, at least for pure entertainment value, it's uh, it's kind of interesting, right? And there's certainly a story there. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's just, just just interesting to try something new, I guess. Definitely. Definitely. And that's and that's something that I kind of want to overcome is in the past, it's always been like a project first, and then that project has turned into a video. But I feel like if I want to continue making better and better videos, I have to start thinking about a good premise for a video and then find a project that fits into that and things like that, where it's like, what would happen? Like, how can we make a great 3d printed skateboard or something that approaches the performance of a good one or, or maybe doesn't even simulate the performance, but has like different characteristics altogether. Um, yeah, it's, a, I've and, always just thought about the physical product first. So it's like a different way of thinking. Totally. Yeah. And I think, I, I think in that way too, oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so I think, I think in that way too, um, one thing that Adam mentioned last week was, uh, wh I think your pick last week was Ryan Trahan and yeah. in all of his videos, I find that so much of what's really interesting are just like his reactions to things or just like the little intricacies that kind of happen along the way versus like yeah, for any sure. sort of actual project. So yeah, that's, that's yeah. some one way to look at it. It's funny. It's funny. When I first started watching him, I was really taken back of like, he seems really awkward on camera. Like he, you know, and all that. And then it really grew on me of like, this is who he is and it's different. Like that's what makes him stand out. And that's what makes his video so good is because he is just being himself. He's not being awkward. That's just the person he is. And he even said like 10 videos in or something on the series he's doing at the moment that people were commenting, you look awkward on camera. You look like, you're struggling to actually talk to the camera and stuff. And he's like, no, this is, this is who I am. That's how I am. That's how I act. Hmm. If I was thinking about that, I was watching um, the Adam Savage and Corridor crew collaboration this week, 
where they re uh, they remade the effect from Chinatown, where a guy puts a stiletto up Jack Nicholson's nose and swipes it to the right, and he cuts a slit in his nose, and there's this big blood splatter. And in the movie, it was done with a practical effect. And so the premise of this collaboration between Adam Savage and Corridor was, can we do it faster with practical effects or with digital effects? So Adam made a practical prop replica. He like took a stiletto. He, I'm not, I'm not going to ruin how he did it because it's actually really interesting to see how he did it. Um, and then Corridor did it all digital and they timed themselves to see who could do it faster. It was an awesome collaboration, like A plus both videos were so interesting. And I was, re- cause I hadn't watched an Adam Savage video in a little while. And as I was watching it, I was like, wow, like the reason this is entertaining is just seeing how Adam Savage works. It's not because of like seeing the finished product. It's just like seeing how he works his way through a problem. Um, and yeah, like sometimes, or maybe most of the time, just seeing how like a specific personality goes through something in like a maker video context, that's what really draws you in. And I don't know if that's how like what yeah. draws people to my videos. I have no idea because I have, I don't have any perspective on myself. I'm just like that's me doing stuff. <laughs> I mean, that's that's definitely like I've talked about that before. Like I watch YouTube videos for entertainment. I don't generally watch videos to learn how to do something. And it is that it's it's watching that person's personality try and get through what they're trying to get through. And that's it definitely with Adam. I mean. I've always enjoyed Adam since Mythbusters. I've watched every episode of Mythbusters and, and all that, and that's why I watched him on YouTube. But watching him in a maker space was so different to, like, say, Mythbusters and interesting to see how he thinks through things because he's a prop builder by trade, essentially. He has a completely different way of making things. He's more like me and not really that it has to look perfect, but just that it has to look good at first glance sort of thing. So, like, just get it done. Mm-hmm. And that's there was this very interesting. There was this very interesting part of the video. Again, I'm not trying to spoil how I did it, how he did it. So I'll talk about it in vague terms. But he made a cut on a piece of metal, and he talked about how the original prop designer made the cut curved because our our eyes look past curves like that in nature. We see straight lines. So if ever there's a curved seam between things, it's very easy for our eyes to just overlook it which is perfect when you're trying to hide a scene in like a fake weapon, for example. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's really cool. I I'm going to hedge a guess. I haven't seen the video, so it's not a spoiler that Adam was faster being the fact that if you were to do, design something for a CNC to cut out, I generally, most of the time you could do it quicker by hand making it yourself. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's kind of apples to oranges because you're talking about like making a physical thing and, and filming it versus compositing it on the computer. Like, it's not like they were, there was a digital fabrication aspect to it. It was that they were, they were doing it in like after effects. Yeah, true. Yeah. But I will say that the reasons why the practical, the practical had an edge over the digital, not saying it won, but it had an edge for reasons that I did not expect, which were, were very interesting. Right. Yeah, I suppose it'd be more like building the physical thing and making a 3D model, not making the cut files and cutting mm. it on the CNC. Yeah. Hmm. So, so I, have right, a, I, video I have a complete non sequitur because Zito's here and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask that. So I was talking about in the last episode in this one that I want to build a canoe and Zito has actually built a canoe. So as someone who's gone through that trial and tribulation, what advice, wisdom, anything would you impart on to me? Right. Well, I feel like I've probably messaged you about it already, <laughs> but certainly, um, you know, the principles of uh, measure twice, cut once kind of a deal goes a long ways in this particular process. Um, and that, it is a 400 hour process kind of there's really no like i think there's really no shortcuts to it it's pretty it's it's a long one but but what i think could be really interesting is if you have ways of integrating 
3D printing or, or interesting ways into certain components, perhaps into your particular canoe. Mm-hmm. I think that could be really interesting. Um, so look for those opportunities. Uh, I think maybe even as you're reading, um, cause yeah, you know, there's definitely been a ton, bunch of canoe builds, but I think there's a way to make it interesting and, and, uh, yeah, I'd start, I'd say start planning that now, you know, I'm, I'm sure you already are, but, but, you know, um, yeah, it would just be interesting to see, obviously, from your perspective, but if you can just really bring in some new components there, I think it's going to be something. Um, other than that, it's a long one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. One, one thing have... you mentioned in, te- in text, which I'm sure you could elaborate on, is project fatigue. So did you have that hit you? No. Like, did you get sick of it at a certain point? So yeah, it certainly took over a year for me to build, I, I think. Uh, and you know, I, I think y'all alluded to my kayak build right now too. Um, I'm at a point where I can build out the top, but then I'm just like, wow, it's so nice to work outside right now. So I'm going to jump on another project. Um, so, so, you know, it's, it's not project fatigue, but it is, you know, it's a lengthy process and you just, you're going to, you're going to want to do different things uh, throughout seasons, throughout the year. And uh, yeah, so that from, from that perspective, I find that, you know, uh, I would jump around certainly because of that. Did you have a, a certain like mishap with not measuring twice and cutting once? Um, not, I think so. Certainly like, you know, stems, things like stems, things like, uh, gunnels, uh, I decided to use, so this is like really specific new stuff that like, you know, folks like Trent Presler would obviously know, but like there's. I did a recurve in my, on the front, uh, end or both uh, actually both on the bow and the stern of my boat. And so that is really tricky and you really need to steam bend, um, sections of your gunnels to be able to fit that. Um, that really took me by surprise. Um, so if you go that route, it's just like, you know, I don't know if you understand everything that I'm saying right now, but it's. Well, so I, I know the stems are basically the front and back of the canoe, like the leading edge and the trailing edge. Yeah. And the gunnels are on the top edge, right? It's kind of like the handrails. That's correct. That's what you hold to get into the boat. That's what you hold in calm water to steady yourself in a lake. And in fast moving water uh, and swift water and rapids, you definitely don't hold those. Um, that'll cause you to that'll cause you to flip. Um, and so, yeah, they're, they're uh, the edge of the boat, if you will. Yeah. And one, you sound one like you're talking from I, experience. Have you flipped yours? Oh yeah. I've flipped it. Uh, not, not the one that I built, but I've, I've paddled in white water. I've paddled oh. on all sorts of water and, uh, yeah, you know, they, they basically teach you to flip. Right. And they're just like, this is, you're going to go down and you touch it, you go down. And, and hmm. you know, the second you touch your gunnels in, in swift water, you're, 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 you're right in the water and you're just, you're swimming before you know it. And you're like, what the heck happened there? <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah. So one thing though, that I did want to mention, um, in terms of a heads up or anything like that is certainly, I find that fiberglassing the inside of anything is super tricky. Oh, it looks, it looks terrifying. It's, it's so you, so the, so here's the thing, you fiberglass the outside first and you're going to have a ton of confidence because it goes well, right? Um, the concave or the convex versus the concave, um, nature of how epoxy flows, drips, and how air bubbles can kind of catch in between like a concave. So like the inside of the boat versus the outside, you're going to have a ton of confidence going into it. And it's going to, unless you have, you know, unless Eden's there, it's going to, it could potentially kick your ass a little bit. Like it's going to, you're just going to have gaps and stuff and it it gets kind of tricky and stuff. So, so I would say ensure that you have two people when you are fiberglassing the inside of your boat. Okay. That's really it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I feel like when I had the idea and I was like starting to look into it more, I was like, oh, I'm kind of nervous that details are going to come up that's going to make me not want to do it. Like there's going to be something that's going to nix the idea in in one fell swoop. Like I, I had the fear that I wasn't going to have enough space, but I measured my garage and it's it's long enough to build like a 15 or 16 foot canoe and and have a de- like the three foot of clear space all around like Ted Moore rec- recommends in the book. Um, and it's cool. Like, I love how in that book, he, he talks about how like pretty much anyone with enough perseverance and time can do it. Like, and all the anecdotes about like, people building them in their dining rooms and stuff. Like it's, it seems pretty magical. 
Ted's a pretty magical man. So I, I had the pleasure of filming one of his uh, last canoe builds. Um, and uh, I've traveled with him to Belize and we've done a whole bunch of uh, things for Bear Mountain. And um, yeah, the way the the guy just, you know, he can build a canoe in his sleep pretty much, right? So So just to watch him work. And when you have a little question, he will tell you the context behind things and just be able to just like, boom. To see that kind of just wisdom in somebody is is pretty incredible. So that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, I got it. I was just in Peterborough. I should have been, gone to the canoe museum there. So they, oh yeah, the canoe museum. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Is that they? Is it? Does that construction? Is it like the full shape and everything? Is that is that there in Peterborough now? I don't know. All I know is that Peterborough is like the canoe heartland. Yeah. Yeah. So he used to be there. He's actually in Westport, which is closer to Ottawa now. Okay. It's only like 45 minutes away from Ottawa that he li- that him and Joan live at now. And, uh, and, and both, uh, both his daughters live in Ottawa. So that's why they, they kind of stick close to Ottawa now. Cool. Yeah. But also going back to the canoe build itself, knowing you and your ability to, you know, get through challenges and stuff, I, you know, I, I hear your worries and I hear your fears. I really would be surprised if you were to get stuck from any of it. Yeah, I was pretty green when I built my canoe. I, I maybe maybe two years of woodworking and, you know, certainly challenges, but there, you know, nothing was going to stop me at that time. And I feel like, you know, yeah, when I when I watch you, you're right there too, right? So I, I don't worry about you getting stuck in that in that way. Yeah, you'll make it through for sure. How does the kayak build compare to the canoe build? So technically it is actually, I, I find it's kind of easier. It's like, you know, so this is CNC um, marine grade ply, one eighth inch marine grade ply. And, you know, so thus far I've had to piece it together like a puzzle piece. So it's thus far easier. I think I, in, in my last part two of my video, it's taken me what, like 30 something hours to get to where I'm at versus honestly in a canoe, this would basically be most of the canoe that I've already built out, um, the kayak versus the canoe. And that would have been at least a 200 hour process, I think, uh, 150 to two hour, 200 hour process. So it's a much easier build. Um, and, and, and the, the intricacy of this sort of a lame reason why I want to build this. There's two reasons. One, I want to get through the, the swift water right beside my house. And I, and I paddle and paddle at this one river and uh, one section of the river. And I can't get up it by myself in a canoe. Mm. I reckon with a double, double bladed paddle, I should be able to get through it. So that's one major reason. But the other major reason is, you know, I love my little drone shots of like looking straight down on the canoe, which I do now. And I just figured if I can build this kayak and it's going to have like all these skateboard lines meeting one another uh, on top, like, like, you know, like you look at like Pask makes, he's making some incredible kayaks right now. Um, just that one drone shot down of like something really intricate can, just, I don't know. I'm just like trying to go for that too, I guess. Nice. What's yeah. the, what's the difference between a canoe and a kayak? Cause I always thought a kayak you sat on and a canoe you sat in. So you have it the other way. Well, the both both of them are sitting in, but I think you kind of have it flipped. So a kayak has a top deck that you crawl, like you yeah. go, your feet go inside of it. Versus a, ca- a canoe, uh, versus a canoe is open, open top. Right. Okay. So okay, because I'm more when I think of kayak, I'm more thinking of like a fishing kayak, like a you know like a plastic one you'd buy from sports store and mm-hmm. sit on top of. There, there are those type of kayaks. And those, I love those open top fishing kayaks. Like there's, I love just being like open like that. And maybe that's why I'm I'm more inclined to like a canoe build than a kayak build. I do love kayaking, but I like the like flexibility of being in a canoe. Yeah. They're just, they're just slower inherently uh, if you're by yourself, but yeah, feed in there and you'll be fine. Yeah. Do you know how to stern uh, a canoe? Um, I don't know if I know what that means, but maybe I know how to do it. <laughs> Just like how to what? It's a stern canoe. Like, so do you know how to like guide a canoe basically, right? Like, like paddle uh, with one person or steer? No, like so basically steer effectively. I do. I, so yes, when I went to Algonquin for the first time, uh, before I went with Grant, that was really the first time I had gone on like a canoe camping trip. 
prior to that, all of the canoeing I had done was like incredibly casual. So it was like on a lake with my dad fishing or like at camp where no one was really like teaching us proper technique. So I learned to J stroke there. So is, I don't know if that's part of what you're talking about. Um, that is certainly part of what I'm talking about. Yes. Yeah. So I basic level, but I'm not a paddling expert by any means. Right on, right on. Well, when you get here, um, we can certainly go for, for a nice paddle and be, uh, be awesome. For sure. I had a, um, like on the topic of, of building and, and getting into making as a skateboarder, did, did any of your woodworking and building start with making skateboard ramps? Where did you do much of that when you were skating and, and now? So no, I was honestly pretty, pretty hands off of a lot of that stuff. Um, not, I think, you know what, honestly, there was, there's a bit of like a macho-ness if I can put it out there sometimes that the guys are just like, no, this is what I do and uh, don't touch my tools and we're going to just get this done. And so, you know, I think to a certain degree, I maybe, I, I didn't really build ramps much. I, I'm certainly into it now. So we're like, you know, we have a new skate park uh, just by us here in Wakefield. And, you know, I helped, uh, I certainly helped build most of those uh, ramps initially. Um, and I love all that stuff now. Uh, and, and so, you know, I'm really into it, but no, that actually wasn't really so much a part of my upbringing or anything. Interesting. I have a, a new dream now, which is when I have a giant workshop one day that I want to build an indoor skate park in part of it. Do it. Absolutely do it. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, especially given Canadian climates, right? It's just like the winter yeah, time. Skate all year round. It's invaluable, right? Just kick flip your table saw. <laughs> How, there'll be a barrier between the table saw and, and the mini ramp just make sure it's a saw stop and that it's like run it you know <laughs> <laughs> will it stop <laughs> one way if to find my entire out. body falls on it <laughs> oh boy yeah there's uh it's so fun that like our next door neighbor there's like two there's two young boys, I think one's like nine, one's maybe like 12 or 13. And they're, they're super hands-on. Like one of them is fixing up a dirt bike. Um, they're always like making stuff. They seem to just have like a really great hands-on childhood. And I saw in the back alley that one of them was building this like massive quarter pipe. And I was looking at it. I was like, this thing's going to be huge, but I'm sad because I haven't seen them like make any progress on it. It's been like in the same state for about like a month and a half now. And I know what happened. Like I was 12 years old once you, you know, you lose interest, but I just like, I'm thinking to myself, like, Oh, that'd be so cool if they actually finished it. I'm, I'm quietly rooting for them, but I'm trying to let them live their own life. Or what if you just went over there some night and just finished it for <laughs> That'd be a great video making my, yeah. I mean, that that's a whole, that's a whole huge part of YouTube in and of itself that I, I've, I'm not, I don't really watch much is the whole, like, random good deeds for stranger things like isn't that like a massive viral video thing like people just giving people money and and those sorts of things totally with just like some like you know somebody filming in the background like <laughs> all right we'll see what happens here or just gopro on them or something yeah yeah not a bad no, idea pretty... mm -hmm. cool 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 lots of ideas um wow we've really we've really gone the full gamut of uh, topics. <laughs> what else? What else do you guys want to talk about? We can, we can talk about anything. Grant's not here, so we don't have to keep the structure. Yeah, we're free flowing. <laughs> uh, well, I I had a question I was going to ask in the after show, but let's bring it into the show show. I was listening to um, Fake Doctors, Real Friends, and they were talking about movies have been in and all that sort of stuff. And I had a thought, what do you think is the most recognizable slash well-known movie ever made? Oh, wow. As in like any person you ask, they know what it is. Maybe not have seen it, but they at least know what it is. I mean, it's going to be, well, it's going to be generational. Like, I don't think kids growing up now have I don't probably think so. seen the original Star Wars trilogy, but that's one of the first that comes to mind for me. Well, that's definitely my answer like, too. It's just Star Wars. Yeah. I mean, if you include all of Star Wars because they've made so many now, then yeah. that could probably be it. 
Like you, if you if you say Star Wars to any person, like obviously not kids, but like any person in the world, they can at least picture some form of like a stormtrooper yeah. or something. I reckon. Yeah, I think that's up there. Mm. I think Harry Potter would probably be up there for me as well because I've seen those movies so many times. Yeah, but that's that's also personal. So I don't know if that's how how ingrained that would be i mean the godfather you know is definitely one of like the highest Mm. grossing movies of all time but i think there's a lot of people who haven't seen it because it's violent and a lot of people like aren't into violence there's a lot but a lot of people wouldn't even know what it is too true and it's all it's relatively old at this point yeah but i feel like even now like you see like rebranded star wars like like things come out in brand but it's like the star wars text and stuff and people just know what it is yeah that's a good point that and marvel i find these days like marvel, the whole yeah. all all of them together just kind of mishmash i find these days mm. yeah. did y'all finish uh obi-wan no <laughs> no i have not no. like i i think the only new star wars i saw was what was like the first one with kylo ren uh, that came out it was like the first one of the new the new Star Wars after the the prequels. The Force Awakens. I think that's the only new Star Wars anything I've seen. I don't know. I don't get I don't get super into like any of the new like superheroes or or trilogies or anything. I also really haven't seen many movies recently. I've been trying to get to the movies and I'm just life gets in the way. I'm still kind of not sure, super, super sure about going to movie theaters myself. I just, I just find them so much more. Yeah. And I'm just finding them just so much more comfortable at home. So I'm just like waiting for things to, to be able to be rented. And then I just rent them on like YouTube or yeah Amazon or something like that. So yeah, I think so I part of it is like rent all my movies. <laughs> part of it is talking with like Ryan on into the spotlight and actually he was in toronto a couple weeks ago and we had like we spent like four hours together just talking and it was it was great he uh he's so passionate about film and like experiencing film in theaters that like it makes me excited to go to the movies i mean another thing too is like i got tickets to um the like a maple leafs game a few weeks ago and after being in that situation where it was like 30,000 people in arena, like m- most of which like weren't wearing masks, I feel like I'm sort of like fully back into normal life at this point. And like any mm-hmm. discomfort that I had is kind of like that just flushed it all out of my system. That, that one experience. Yeah. For me, I don't even think it's like a COVID worry thing at all. I think I'm just like so much more comfortable just at home watching a movie in my yeah. own setting. And I'm just like, I don't, I don't really think I need that setting anymore. <laughs> That's maybe we'll just, just become maybe. introverts. I don't know. I still need it. I love going out. Do you, so do you have a, do you have a, um, like a setup or will you just watch it on your laptop? Like a movie watching setup. So we have a projector that we kind of play and like, you know, kind of got the little sound system going, but like. It's pretty 50 50 because sometimes we're just lazy and it's like late at night and we're just like, we'll just watch it on the laptop. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think if I had a projector or some like good setup, that would definitely incentivize me to watch more movies at home because just having that experience in a theater is such a big part of it, like seeing it on a big screen with big sound, with good sound. Yeah, I'm still thinking about the most recognizable movie of all time. I feel like Star Wars is it. I don't know if there's any. It's got to be Star answer. Wars. If you were yeah, to, ask, I've been thinking about it for days. If you were to ask people like five years ago, it might have been Frozen. There was a point where Frozen was like absolutely everywhere. You could not get away from Frozen. But people without kids that don't have anything to do with kids would have no idea what Frozen is. Yeah, it's everywhere, but they wouldn't pay attention to it. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Like it was, it was. I, I just it was popular enough that like they might have had a uh, like a vague sense of it, but you're right; they wouldn't have like a strong attachment to it of any sort. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I just can't think of anything that would be more well known than Star Wars. 
All right. right. Well, I think with that, I want to start transitioning to thanking our Patreon supporters who help us make this show possible. Uh, they all get access as well to the after show and pre-show uh, where we chatted with Zito for a while about what we've been working on. And I'm sure we'll have more great discussions in the after show, but I wanted to give a special shout out to our F clamp level supporters, Brent Jarvis from clean cut woodworking, Vincent Ferrari from because we make Austin from high caliber craftsman and Scott Orm from dad at yourself DIY. Everyone who supports on Patreon also gets a, a leather keychain hand embossed and stamped by yours truly hand everything. I, I mean, I do every step from start to finish, except the stamp is 3d printed. I did not carve it by hand, but that would be kind of a cool project. Um, I know people do like hand carved lino for like lino block printing. I wonder if you could do a similar thing with, I, I'm sure you could, but it would be pretty labor intensive. That actually be a pretty cool effect. If you had an entirely <laughs> hand carved leather stamp, I don't know if I want to do it, but I'm sure it would be beautiful. You just went down a huge rabbit hole in your head. You hand, you did hand design the stamp before it was printed. That's true. I hand computer designed it based on the logo. Hand computed it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Um, with that, Clamp Mendations. Clamp Mendations. Did we, uh, did, do you have one, Zita? I do, actually. Okay. Uh, do you want to kick so it off? I was thinking- yeah, sure. I was thinking about it all week once once y'all uh, ha- talked about ha- inviting me as a host there. So I've been really into structure lately, um, working on the way on my sauna and stuff. And then I've uh, recently reconnected with my pal uh, Trustin Timber um, on both the gram and on YouTube. And uh, yeah, he is building an incredible little log cabin. Um, you know, milling every, every, every tree and really putting some love into every log that kind of goes into this thing. Um, both him and his partner there, they, she's got an incredible little uh, YouTube channel as well. They're just a power powerhouse and a force to be reckoned with. Um, so my pal, Tristan Timber uh, is awesome. And a little fun fact, he also built, uh, Drake's drake's basketball course course court in his home oh, so wow that's sick. So while you think he's oh. like a full cowboy living out in the woods in, in in ontario he's uh he also he you know he also did that as well <laughs> that's sick <laughs> yeah i've um i've been thinking a bit recently about like i don't know exactly what you would call it but i guess greenwood building from like logs and sticks and things because we're going to this cottage in a couple weeks and with a huge storm that happened, the Duraco, I think like a month or two ago at this point, um, they have a bunch of downed trees and things. So I'm actually going up early on Saturday to get a lay of the land and see if there's anything that I can build something from. I'm thinking of trying to like build a bench from like downed branches and things. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of just want to see and see if if there's if the trees speak to me, if they say that they want to be built into any like outdoor furniture item but I haven't really done anything like it before. I think it could be a lot of fun. What area are you going to? We are going, uh, it's a little, it's not too far away. It's a bit past Peterborough. Um, I will look and and tell you while someone else is talking <laughs> later on in the show. Well, I'll do my clip mandation then. Uh, I'm going to clip mandate the movie Humble on Netflix. It's uh, Adam Sandler's new movie. And it's um, I've heard really good things. Kind of like, that. it's such a good movie. Like there, it's not there's no comedy in it at all. Like it's just very heartfelt, and it's kind of I keep telling people it's like Adam Sandler version of The Blind Side with Sandra Bullock. Um, just yeah, really heartfelt. Like he plays such a serious role, but it's like I reckon, and many people have said it like better than his comedy. It's like the perfect role for him. And cool. yeah, yeah great, I, great movie. One um, review I was reading was that like, even though it's about basketball, like Adam Sandler was very well suited to it because it's, it's kind of like an allegory for the movie business or, or I guess more so just that like the sports business and the movie business are very similar. So he could uh, yeah, yeah, kind of be genuine about it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it had a lot of real plays in there as well. Like at the end in the credits, it showed – like so and so played as themselves, and so and so played as themselves, and and all that, and oh, then cool. um, 
it really just really got me into wanting to watch basketball. I mean, I've wanted to watch it for a while, but just need to find like who I want to follow because I won't watch a sport unless I have a team. But yeah, my wife wants me to go for the Raptors because that's who she goes for, but that's only because Drake owns them and no thanks. <laughs> does he actually own them? No, he doesn't. Yeah. Dra- no, yeah, he, he doesn't. doesn't. I don't Drake think Drake so. or Kanye? I don't think either of them own the Raptors. Hang on. Hang on a sec. Drake's, um, Drake's courtside every every time, and I think he's like uh, who owns the Raptors? It's the Maple ambassador. Leaf Sports and Entertainment. I don't I don't know who owns that. Hey, the basketball team. I'm sure, we can find out. <laughs> I don't think she's going to be the definitive oh, answer. <laughs> she goes, she, no, she goes. Oh, he doesn't own it, but Drake. Yeah, he's. I mean, he's a he's a fan for sure. Oh, I thought she said he owned him. He's like the Spike Lee, uh, but for our Canadian basketball team, pretty much, right? He's front court. He's front court every game, so. Right. No. Well, oh, well, by the way, the cottage is in Lakefield, Ontario. So it's it's uh, a bit up the river from Peterborough. Uh, my clamidation for this week uh, I'm going to be basic and recommend a Netflix show. The third season of Umbrella Academy came out a little while ago, and it's really good. I'm really enjoying it. It's very, very fun. What's it about exactly? I've seen that. I don't. I have no clue. It's kind of like a superhero show. Um, I don't know what universe it fits into, if any. But uh, the premise of the show as a whole is like you have all of these kids who have superpowers and this eccentric billionaire brought them all together to make them into a um, like a crime fighting team. And I guess spoiler alert: if no one has seen season one, I won't spoil the whole thing. But they end up being a little dysfunctional, and then they all have to work together to solve some problems. It's uh, it's really funny. Uh, it's with Ellen Page now, uh, Elliot Page, who's really good in it. Um, it's it's very fun, I would say. Like all, all around, just a good time. Really cool. I love the spins uh, various various types of shows are having now with superheroes like that and the boys over on Amazon Prime as well. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of cool stuff happening in that space. I think um, I know that Umbrella Academy is based on a comic. I think it's called like the Dark Horse something, um, but it's – not called the same thing. Anyways, I'm I'm out of my league now. I don't know enough to actually talk about how it was produced. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right. Well, before we head into the after show, um, Zito, thanks so much for coming on yet again. I feel like that flew by. We've been talking for like over an hour. Um, if anyone doesn't follow Zito already, he builds amazing things out of skateboards and timber. He's building a sauna cabin building all sorts of amazing stuff his links will be in the show notes um at zito zito on instagram he's on youtube anywhere else uh where the people should find you um no that's pretty much it yeah instagram uh youtube it's mostly it and yeah i just want to thank y'all so much for having me on that's always a blast i'm always like hey if if any of y'all are missing i'm I'm always kind of up for it (laughs) so yeah let's uh, do it again sometime yeah, I honestly listen to y'all like every week and, and I, I seriously love it. So that's great. The last time you were on, was, yeah. was Grant also not here? Were you replacing Grant? No, Grant was here. Everyone was here. Okay. I think I was like a guest uh, right. on that one. So yeah, gotcha. I think y'all were here. I'm pretty sure. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. Zito is a um, bushwhacker, by the way. Oh, sorry. I didn't even think that was a great thing. <laughs> All right, bushwhack. Is that like a, is that a what is that Australian like an Australian word. word of the week right now? That's my Australian word of the week. Yeah, I, I blew bushwhack. right by it, but Adam snuck it in. Bush. Did you make that up, or or are you just like are you making that up, or is that a real thing? No, it's a real thing. Oh my god! Okay, it's an Australian <laughs> slang. Okay. okay. I mean, Neat. I bushwhacker does have a yeah, definition. You also got your sentence, so. <laughs> Bushwhacker yeah. does have a definition in North America. Like I would, I don't know if I would say bushwhacker, but bushwhacking is like is paving a path through the woods, maybe with like a machete, and you're cutting your way through branches and things. So a bushwhacker would be someone who okay. does that. Interesting. Is that not what yeah, it is in Australia? No, it's not. No, it's not that. Oh, what is it then? <laughs> 
It's literally just someone that lives in the bush. Okay. okay. Okay, because I mean, uh, Morley, your your definition there, I honestly was just like, oh, you know, we were bushwhacking. That's just like just trekking through the bush, like just trekking through the woods is I, my definition. Oh, of even if you were on like an established trail? Um, Not necessarily an established trail, but that doesn't mean you're making the trail or like having to cut the trail at all or anything like that. It's literally just like walking through the woods sometimes. Okay. You bushwhack, you bushwhack your way here kind of a deal, you know? Yeah, when I think of bushwhacking, I think like you're getting hit in the face with vines and things and you're like pulling branches down. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Like literal term. <laughs> you're whacking the bush. All right. Well, we will continue this episode in the after show. Again, if you want to listen to that, you can support the show on Patreon. Uh, so bye. Bye. bye.